This is Marilyn Hughes of the Out-of-Body Travel Foundation. You can find us online at outofbodytravel.org. And today we are interviewing Sean Graham. And we're going to be talking about a life-changing near-death experience that he had in 2016. So Sean Graham is the host of the thought-provoking Chasing the Truth show, and that deals with the paranormal and all things unexplained. The show launched in May of 2018 and instantly created a buzz throughout the paranormal community. Prior to the launch of Chasing the Truth, Graham spent more than 15 years in the medical field, and during his tenure in the healthcare sector, he suffered a leg amputation stemming from a very serious flesh-eating infection. He was on life support for more than a week, and it was during this time on life support that Sean had a lengthy near-death experience, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Welcome, Sean. Hey, thank you, Marilyn. I appreciate the invitation to be on Out of the Body Travel Show. I guess I I got that right, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yep, that, that's that's that'll work. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So this is great. So um, this is a really interesting story to me because this is a case where Sean, you had mentioned to me that before your near death experience, you were. Kind of, um, I don't know if you would have called yourself an atheist or an agnostic, or if you just really just weren't interested in God. What happened? What was your state of mind before this happened to you? Okay, my state of mind before this, I was, you know, I believed in God. Um, okay, but uh, I had a lot of issues with certain things that happened in my life that sometimes I wound up you know, not blaming God for it. And then it, one thing led to another, and I wound up being an alcoholic after, uh, you know, very, various things led me to that point. And I'm not going to blame it on any one particular thing, person, or whatever. I'll just blame it on myself. So the, uh, you know, I was in a really, really low spot right before all this uh, near-death experience happened. And so when you were in the low spot... Um, you were saying here, you said that you sometimes blamed God for bad things that had happened in your life. And I think that's interesting because, you know, I think it's not an uncommon, an uncommon thing to do. You know, I hear a lot of people who, especially when they're younger, have a tendency to, um, either blame God or blame other people for, you know, regular events in our lives that were negative I'm I'm wondering if you could just expand on that a little bit as to what was your thinking that um, made you direct that anger for those events in your life on God rather than towards either just, you know, the nature of reality here in terms of that, you know, we go through suffering and things like that, or towards other people who may have been involved in those situations. What was it that you feel made you feel the most comfortable blaming it on God? Well, uh, for the majority of my life, I always had, you know, outwardly, a lot of people wouldn't have believed this if I do tell them, but I had this sort of chip on my shoulder. You know, I thought, well, okay. I'm in control of my life, and no, ma- no matter what it is, I'm doing this, I'm free to do this, no matter what the outcome, I'm always right, you're always wrong kind of mentality. And, uh, you know, I went through various stages in my life where, you know, I did, uh, I was baptized at, at one time and still claim that actually. But, uh, after, I don't know, I, it was just a, like a seesaw. I would find uh, reasons not to believe that in God at certain points in my life and get to the point where, you know, I wouldn't look inward and say, well, the, this particular event was not my fault, and but it actually probably was, uh, and then blame it all on God, you know, or blame it on something else, or, you know, blame it on my work environment, and various things, you know, I was always putting it toward blaming somebody else for stuff that was my fault, more or less. That's interesting because, you know, ironically, in the Out-of-Body Travel Foundation, we focus a lot on the path of purification of the soul. 
And this is interesting because this is exactly what we talk about when souls are, you know, before they enter into that journey, that there is this tendency not to do that self-reflection that um, can result in that purification journey. And this is so interesting. And so when you blamed God, did you also blame, like, other people? Sounds like you blamed circumstances. And I think that everybody listening, including myself, can absolutely relate to that because I think that is a natural human tendency to um, find a way to take off our shoulders the requirement to do you know, more self-evaluation or evaluation of our lives and how we got to where we are and all that kind of stuff. Well, one, the one key question that was answered to me in my near-death experience was, uh, the quote unquote belief in God. That belief in God to me always had that little factor on the end of it. What if there's not a God? And that, okay. that, that little trick there in my mind was always the wiggle room to, you know, uh, unhook me from that I believe in God mentality, if you, you can call it a mentality. Um, and I use that uh, either, you know, subconsciously or consciously to you know blame a lot of stuff on god or say i don't believe in god because of xyz okay. if does that make sense yeah you know because this is interesting i hear from a lot of people where they have different reasons for not believing in god you know and um and you're explaining it really well for a lot of people what they experience um and it almost seems like i think sometimes if we it, and, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Um, you know, if we don't believe in God, like you're saying, when you when you would find a way to say, okay, I don't know if God exists, does that make us then feel more like we don't have to take personal responsibility or look as closely at l events in our life? Um, is that how you feel that you were operating, or was it different? Yeah. <laughs> I've created so many different opportunities to actually come up with whatever it was to say. I can remember um, being young in my teen teenage years, and I thought I was wrapped in this darkness. It was just, that was my home kind of kind of deal. After, you know, being growing up in a Baptist family, uh, you know, I was exposed to uh, Christianity throughout my life, and, you know, I think I was baptized in uh when i was 21 this is before i got baptized actually uh but okay uh i uh, you know it was sort of like a blanket to me you know, uh, to be a part of this you know, i don't know if it's darkness it was kind of crazy uh, this is i think i've told uh, one other person about this my girlfriend i'm pretty sure i did if not i'll, I'll tell her real quick but anyway <laughs> 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 she, uh, you know, it, it was one of the lowest parts of my life. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff is, okay, why can't I feel you, God? The, you know, and then, you know, expecting an immediate answer in kind with the, okay. the, the question. And it was, it was sort of like an immediate response. You know, you hit a button, I answer a day, why aren't you giving me, are you correct or not? instead of just silence that I perceived, if that makes sense. Right. It makes sense perfectly. And so you said that you felt like you were comfortable within this type of darkness that you felt kind of blanketed by yeah. during that period? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. But this okay, was my... Let's move uh, up. Yeah, the, that, that was my first years of uh, teenage kind of... I didn't know what in the hell <laughs> I was doing. Still, to to a certain point, you could say I come back with, uh, and I wish I come back with the uh, Encyclopedia Galactica after my near death experience. But I'm done with the Cold Book era now. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, and and so this darkness. How would you characterize it? Was it like um, like a rebellion against the fact that? God would not answer you, you know, very suddenly and very quickly in the way that you expected. Was it anger? Was it, it, it blame, was, rage, or all of these things and others? 
There was Things a little like bit. That. There was a little bit of rage in it. It just felt like I had this incredible hole, this black hole in, inside of me that nothing really filled. Period. Okay. Uh, okay. And I honestly, I carried that throughout my life. To tell you the truth, that that inner uh, hole that you know I would stick X Y Z in there. Uh, you know whether it was a relationship I was in at the time and it failed or whatever, and then it, whatever it was I stuck in that hole failed, and then I'd move on and say, okay, blah, this is all God's fault, and or I don't believe in God anymore or whatever. Okay. And so it was it was almost a way of, of avoiding having to look into these events in your life any deeper. It made it a little simpler, at least in the way you were thinking at the time. Yeah. And this a... is interesting because you were um you were about forty five or forty six when you had your near death experience then? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. And um so tell us about what happened uh then. So you mentioned the flesh-eating bacteria. What happened that caused your death? Let's start there. Okay, the flesh-eating, uh, what, what stemmed for me to get a flesh-eating bacteria was I was in a car accident, and it was my fault. I was drunk driving at the time. And um, okay. the, the thing of it is, it didn't happen that day. I you know, wound up with a big bruise on my leg where the dashboard went, kind of crunched my leg. And I pried my left leg out out, out from underneath the uh, dashboard and wound up in the ER. Uh, and certain things happened in cir- afterwards. Uh, but uh, a week later, which you know, this was November 17th of 2015, that was the okay. day of the accident. Or my, man, what, it was my fault. It wasn't an accident. It was my fault. Um, seven days later was the day after Thanksgiving. Uh, at that point, uh, my leg looked like Freddy Krueger got a hold of it. Uh, wow. Literally, it was just, ugh. um, but, uh, uh, at, over the course of those seven days, a lot of things happened one right after another. And of course, you know, I wasn't aware that I was infected with anything, as the infection was taking hold, it was, you know, messing with my cognitive abilities. Uh, okay. you know, obviously, I wasn't drinking at the time, so I was going through some sort of DTs at that time, you know, re- withdrawal from alcohol. So all this impacted. And what is a DT for, because uh, I don't know what that is. Delirium tremens, you know, where you okay. shake and, and all this and what would stuff. that be? That, it's that just a, it's just a, of... it's a withdrawal symptomology of, of any kind of medication, drugs, or whatever. You go okay. through some sort of withdrawal. So, I, you know, I wasn't drinking at the time. And uh, uh, all that on top of everything was really affecting how I was thinking. So I wasn't really paying attention other than, you know, I knew my leg was hurting day by day. It was getting worse. But in the back of my mind, uh, the, the initial physician interaction I was I had said, this bruise is so deep it's going to look worse before it gets better. And I, I kept that in my my mind. And it slowly grew in uh, the the spot. And then, you know, I wound up in the emergency room with my leg looking like chopped liver. <laughs> okay. And, and this doctor, uh, ironically, the physician that took care of me the first time was the physician that was in, came on board with uh, uh, initial aid to me. Then a surgeon I've known for like a decade walks into the room and evaluates me real quick. Of course, you know, by that time I was sicker than sick. This is the sickest point in my life I'd had ever been. And and the doc said, Sean, you've got a 30 to 40% chance of even surviving this amputation that I've got to do on you. And he, he loaded me up with a bunch of medication for pain and whatever to start prepping me for the, uh, for the actual surgery. And he said, I just gave you a lot of narcotics to help with the pain. You got to name your, uh, caretaker, your medical caretaker, which I think I've named my sister at the time. Um, next thing I knew, you know, I went through the whole gamut of, 
uh, saying, hey, sis, brother, all this other stuff, uh, you know, forgive me for whatever, and said a little prayer right before uh, the drugs took, took effect. But during the whole entire course, you know, even at the initial, Sean, you're probably going to die statement from the surgeon that, uh, you know, obviously I've known for a while, I did not have a panic attack. You would think that, you know, hey, you're going to die, buddy. You would uh, come back with this uh, holy, you know, insert your favorite word there. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I didn't. It was like being uh, washed with this. Oh, this is this is it. This is this is the closing of this door. This this end of my life is right on me. I'm just about ready to walk through this door. It's like taking a deep breath and going, "It's okay." Yeah, and from that point forward, it was okay. Yeah, was. And in that moment, you also felt moved to pray. Yeah. Was there was there any like a a forethought to that, or was it just kind of like habitual? Was it a no? It wasn't habitual. It was it was. uh, it was a short one. It was, I know I've done wrong. Uh, please forgive me for what I have done against you, towards you, and please forgive me for what I've done. And I think that was, you know, it may be paraphrasing, but it was short and sweet. And the next okay. thing, yeah, you know, next thing I uh, realized was I woke up in this black void. It was void of everything, void of light, void of sensation. If you've ever done any spelunking or walking in the back of caves, you can go back there with headlamps or whatever source of uh, light, and you can turn it off, and it's pitch black. It was that pitch black, plus you didn't hear any echoes, noises, drips, anything. There was no sound, no physical uh, uh, realization if there was heat or cold sources, nothing. Other than I was conscious okay. in the middle of this. Okay, and so you entered the void, and what happened when you were there? What did you feel there? Was there anything interesting, unique there? That um, Were you having any thoughts of any kind, or were you just kind of well, taking it all in? You know, at first, I, I knew, I said, well, maybe I'm, I'm in the process of passing away or dying. Uh, that was forefront on my on my uh, noggin to <laughs> kind of uh, but uh, you know I I would scream out and I couldn't hear an echo report uh, you know from the noise I was trying to make I could not hear that uh, if it was just stark emptiness nothing okay. you know emptiness yeah. That's it. Yeah, you know, it was it was surrounding me. It wasn't inside of me actually. It was, I wasn't afraid of it, other than I'm like, oh, okay, maybe this is just you know something coming up, maybe. So, uh, yeah, and a lot of near death experiencers and people who have out of body experiences report visiting the black void. So this will be familiar to some of our listeners. Um, but at some at one point during this. Um, time in the void, something changed. And can you tell me what happened that led to that change and what happened then? What happened after this particular point? Um, you know, for whatever, I can't, time to, during this entire near death experience is such a wild concept to me. I, it makes sense in my head at some points, and sometimes it's just like, well, okay, I can't grasp that. So uh, to to give you a time frame of what happened between this point A to point B uh, in this uh, before I entered heaven phase, um, uh, I I can't really tell you. I don't know. Uh, but after a time, uh, this eye opens up in front of me. Out of this dark, bleak void, this eye is illuminated in front of me. Just one single eye. And the, okay, and is it? Is it like a small eye, or is it like an eye that is the size of the the, the sky that you're seeing? Um, is it up in the sky? Is it right in yeah, front of you? It was probably, it wasn't something that consumed my entire visual field, if that's what you're asking. It was, okay. you know, it was, it was a large eye, like something was either, you know, I, I, I don't have a frame of reference other than there's eye and there's black void around it. Yeah. And it was okay. large enough for me to take note of it. 
that this large eye, but it wasn't a human eye. It wasn't any other other than it was a lizard eye. Instead, it had a horizontal slit, it had a vertical slit. Okay. Slowly opened and then slowly closed. I didn't feel anything with it other than, what in the hell was that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, then, you know, after it closed, it became really dark again. And then from after a time, yeah, another one opened up. And then another one beside it opened up. And then that one, you know, same same event, slowly closed, went black again. And then you know, over a course of, a, I guess, a lengthy time, my entire visual field was filled with nothing but eyes, opening and closing. And, and it got to where while I wasn't in a black void anymore, it was just, I was surrounded by these eyes. It was like being in the middle of a snow globe, if you will. And okay. every direction I looked, I could see all you know eyes all around me. And Interesting. Uh, yeah, it was. It was. It, I could say it freaked me out, and then again, it didn't freak me out. I'm like, okay. And then I started hearing questions about certain events in my life that was so intimate, other than me and you know one other person, or or if I was alone, totally. Uh, would know, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I thought, well, do I answer this or do I not? And I was like, well, heck, if you know that kind of level of detail, uh, like standing in front of a, a mirror when I was a kid or being shocked by, you know, I can remember when I was a little kid, I stuck a finger, a fingernail clips in a wall socket, shocked the living crap out of me. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I got I got asked about that, and I was like, "Well, there will, you know, wasn't anybody there," so you know, I answered in kind, thinking, "Well, if they they know this, you know, why not just ask ask or answer the actual questions before me?" And you know, I could tell you, I answered so many freaking questions about you know little things, big things, big decisions, little decisions. You know. You know, why did I pick this color uh, uh, suit going to high, high school graduation? Why did I pick that? You know, it was just one of those, I guess you could call it maybe a life review in part, but it was a weird one uh, from the, I don't even know if you, I can classify it as a life review. It was more or less a question and answer about certain particular events. Okay. So there was a similarity with a life review. And so when you went through these questions, um, uh, was there any kind of internal process going on? I guess you were evaluating events to a pretty, a pretty, uh, a, a very carefully, carefully unfolding uh, there, there was way of looking at it. Well, well to, you know, to kind of jump to the end of these question and answer sessions, it it got really in depth. I remember stuff that I didn't even think I could recall anymore or even have a notion that right. I knew. There was one event uh, um, that ended it all, the question and answer session. I got asked about a particular event. I was maybe about three or four years old, and I was in this old coal town that my uh, family periodically inhabited. I lived there. And at that time, when I was three or four years old, my aunt uh, that has now passed um, um, over a decade and a half ago was living there, and she sent me to this grocery store that was uh, in this community, in this coal camp. And I remember running up to the coal camp, and my uh, aunt told me just tell them put it on my bill, and I'll pay it later. Uh, I was like, okay, cool. And here I was walking up uh, near this train track, which this particular uh, uh, store was uh, right next to. That's how it accepted some shipments and stuff sometimes. But um, I looked down and saw a Coke bottle cap right next to the railroad track, and I reached down and picked it up. And I got asked about why did I pick that Coke bottle cap up. And I thought, wait a minute, is this is this what the afterlife is supposed to be? And I, I mean, I cussed like a sailor after that. I kind of got a little perturbed after you know, all these rounds of questioning. And then they're questioning me about picking up a bottle cap when I'm three years old. 
and uh, I cussed them out, uh, cussed whatever these eyeballs were at the time out. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Uh, gotta send that. a robo caller just called me, but uh, uh, I can you know uh, after a, a rather fruitful, fruitfully long, uh, thick uh, cursing out of me against these particular eyeballs, I said, well, "What in God's name is all of this uh, supposed to be? Is this all of the afterlife?" Blah 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 blah. And then all of a sudden, all the eyes just closed all at once, and I was surrounded by darkness except for a set of two eyes, and they were attached to, the, to this entity. That I'm like, "Okay, what are you?" And to you know, to uh, describe what the entity looked like, it would look like uh, maybe a lizard kind of. I don't I don't know exactly what to what to frame it as. It looked like a lizard with smooth skin, dry, and it wasn't it wasn't scaly. What it was and wasn't kind of deal, and it was looking at this huge opal iridescent opal looking thing that was you know in the house that i, I inhabit now the I've, it's over 120 year old, years old and it has these big doorways that are larger than normal doorways you would see in mon, modern day construction and it was even larger in scale than uh, this opal was versus the door that that's in my house and um, it was looking at the at this particular opal and i was like what in the heck is this so I can't say that I walked up to this entity or that I floated up to it. I, I honestly can't tell you other than I don't think I was walking. But uh, I looked at it, and this, this thing looked back at me, and I said, what are you looking at? And I said that out loud. That was actually one of the few times that I remember actually opening my mouth and hearing my voice. Was this, um, was this a uh, lizard being? Was he a biped, or was he on all fours? No, it was a, was it was a biped. Upright? It was a biped. Okay, go ahead. An unclothed biped. Uh, so uh, here I, you know, what it did was it moved away from this opal. I watched it moved away, and I got closer to the opal to pay attention to what in the heck this thing was worried about or was interested in. So I turned back around and looked at this opal, and I gazed into the opal, and I saw another uh, man, another human, you know, just floating in, you know, like I was floating kind of stuff. Okay, and, and I before you go forward, I have yeah, a, sure. a question on Absolutely. detail. Were you saying that the... Um, the lizard type being was licking the opal, or was he just looking at it? Looking, L O O K. So he was looking at it. Okay, not, go not ahead. Licking. Sorry, not licking. Wanted to clarify just because it oh, can have different meanings, you know. No, no, it okay. wasn't. It wasn't licking. <laughs> it was looking. <laughs> okay. Uh, so forgive me for my southern opal. accent. But there you go. No worries, no okay. worries. Uh, right. Forgive me for my hearing issues. That's but, right. um, <laughs> so you 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 become aware of another presence mm -hmm. inside the opal. It was inside the opal. Was, or I could I couldn't say what it was either than either than it was like peering through a window pane, kind of. Okay. Or okay. maybe a monitor of some sort. I you know it, it was still an iridescent um, opal. The iridescence, if you if you recall the the white paint jobs they had back in the nineties and early two thousands that you know had that pearl coat you know that kind of so oh, yeah it like that yeah. but it was like a liquid you could see the iridescence swirling around in in it at a distance and as I got closer I was able to see you know, this male or whatever whoever it was but and, and uh, um, but this male was having questions being questioned about, you know, not necessarily about my, my, uh, what I was questioned about. It was like being questioned. Uh, this male was being questioned about his life and back and forth. And I'm like, okay, no. being questioned by the lizard or by another? The, li the lizard at the time when I, you know, I, I, I guess, I don't know if you can call forced, but uh, when, when this, the entity just moved backwards. 
he broke he she whatever you want to call this thing i I don't have a definitive answer of sex so i don't know um uh, broke contact obviously because i was between it and the opal the opal um i got Oh, ask, re, ask the question again. Let me refocus what I've been trying to say. Was the lizard asking the questions, or was the oh, person okay, 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 questions from okay. another source? Okay. Well, what it was is, was this, this particular person was, you know, I was looking inward outside of what I perceived as, instead of me being inside this uh, uh, globe, if you will, of eyes peering inward, toward me i was on the outside of the globe looking in at this particular uh male whoever it was if you does that make sense what i just said yeah mm-hmm. okay. and um so the next thing i knew i was you know bum fuzzled uh to borrow an old uh, southern slang word uh confused <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> so I was. I like yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> Thumb puzzle. Yeah. So the uh, so here I am, just confused. I, you know, I, my curiosity got the better of me, and I reached out and touched this opal. You know, you know. Okay. I, and so I, and it was like it wasn't a hard surface. It was like sticking your hand in a bucket of paint more or less with you know it didn't have a warm sensation or a cold sensation other than it had that viscous sensation okay so it was kind of a, li- a liquid pearlized substance yeah, something something's all i can tell you and you know, i was you know <laughs> just curiosity and i could see my hand inside of it then all of a sudden it was like either i was drawn into it or i fell into this iridescent pearl kind of liquid sensation and it was just surrounding me okay at that time and i will i i got bombarded with all kinds of uh, it was sort of like being in the middle of a city for the first time and being you know like if you've ever been to new york city or any of the larger cities and you're right in the middle of a bustle bustling street and whoops (laughs) no siri i was not talking to you (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the uh, uh, just being bombarded with such new, strange, overwhelming—not overpowering, but overwhelming—new sensations. It was, it was sort of like what type oh, of sensations were they? Uh, at first, it was just so overwhelming. Uh, it didn't hurt. Um, it, uh, was it energy? Was it just like it, a, a it different was, type of energy? It would, it, to this point is where I wish I was a poet so I could actually, you know, confiscate words and say, okay, it was like this. You could say it was energy, but then again, it wasn't. It was sort of like my, my thought processes, my, my uh, ability to uh, comprehend everything around me expanded, you know, exponentially. Okay, so you entered into possibly one of the phases of the God mind, where you're starting to understand mysteries and things that you didn't understand before. Would that be correct? Mm, I'm not exactly sure if I entered a God mind, but I will tell you what happened to me. You know, how you, however okay. you interpret this, that's up to you. But um, A lot of near-death experiencers report experiencing things where they... Um, they understanding is implanted within them and they you know a lot of people refer to it as like god consciousness or god mind and suddenly they understand mysteries that they never understood before or their thinking is just greatly expanded Mm. well uh let me let me go through to the you know after this sensation maybe maybe then maybe this will explain it to you i'm not going to use the term i'm just going to tell you how how i saw it okay um with uh with the sensation it was sort of like if you've ever been in a dark room and you open your eyes and get you know like on a on a midnight stroll and it's dark around you and all of a sudden you get bright lighted by a oncoming car sort of that okay. sensation and your eyes gets uh, desensitized to the bright light and it was sort of like that i was getting used to 
this, these new sensations. I, you know, at the end of this, once I started to actually, you know, comprehend what was going on, uh, being able to, you know, discern things around me, it was like I felt a little warmer. That that much I can honestly tell you. Um, uh, this entity uh, started, it wasn't like it appeared before me. It was, I recognized that it was next to me. Started recognizing. Okay. Was it the same, was it the same, um, no, it was which not. entity are you referring to? Is it I was not, entity? I was unaware that I was ever next to the, the, the lizard creature after this ever again. But I realized okay. where, where it was, but. Uh, I was not in communicating with this particular lizard creature, or was I physically near it now after that point? Okay. 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 So you said that there was an entity that was near you. Was this the the, the other man who was being questioned, or was this something else? No. Well, all the all the the stuff well, before uh, I was I entered, sucked in, or whatever you want to call. However, I was mm-hmm. consumed by this pearl esque thing all that was left behind it was it was just you know like i entered into another existence well yeah another existence yeah, I guess. that would be very very much in line with the way people experience these things because very often in the mystical realms and in the uh, near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences people will you know once you touch something you will then be pulled into it and into that world and um, so, yeah, this is very, very um, right in line with what a lot of people have experienced. But go ahead. So you're inside there, and you're feeling this expansion going on of some kind, and this mm. energy. Well, it was, um, it was as, sort of like walking. Happened. It was like walking through, uh, not walking, but at this point, from Moving. this point, uh, at this point, I never had a comprehension of having a body at that point from this point forward, unless I physically or mentally wanted to see my hand or whatever. I, everything everything around me was, it wasn't exactly light. It wasn't exactly dark. It was, it was everything. I was aware of consciousnesses around me, entities around me and the entity before me. uh, Okay. I perceived as an angel. But okay. uh, it didn't have a form that I, I could say, hey, this was a human form or this was a, this kind of form or this it had a set of eyes or hands or anything like that. It, I was very aware of uh, there was an enti- entity before me. Now, this entity didn't have a verbal name. Uh, it was okay. sort of like if uh, if you walk into you walk into a room and it's empty and the family around you, you know, you know, somebody that you're really close to you walks in and you got your back to wherever portal that this person walks into and you can feel their presence, you know, that distinct presence feeling. That was this uh-huh. entity's name. You know, when I start te- getting getting to this point of the story, when I really get engrossed into it and started, you know, the only ones really heard any of this in detail is only a couple of people. One of them is you know, my girlfriend and, uh, when I get to this point, I rename this entity instead of saying, uh, th- remember this entity that I told you didn't have a name but had a feeling and that was its name? Uh, oh, I refer to that entity as Bob. <laughs> just for, okay. Just for, <laughs> just for uh, reference points. So. Okay. Okay. And then after that, it was, it was my... To be able to tell you what I could see, feel, think, uh, understand... It, it was like it wasn't like you you said the instilled uh, knowledge into you. It wasn't like that. It uh, wasn't okay. It wasn't like that. It was as Bob uh, referred to it, referred it to me as I'm going to we're going to go uh, I'm, we're going to do things and encounter things that is going to help you remember is how okay. Bob came to me with this. So you know. At this point, yeah. whether the, uh, I did this first or this second or, you know, time at that point was more, it wasn't like how it controls us now with, you know, you can measure it by the watch band on your wrist. 
right. Yeah, well, you were in time. Yeah. It was, right. Well, what it was is it, time existed. It was sort of like uh, um, I eternal. It eternal. Was not, no, no. Let me let me okay. finish. Let me finish. The the time existed. It was sort of like wind, you know, how wind blows and it can speed up and it swirl and come from any direction, every direction. But it also had, uh, I had control over it. I could go forward, backwards, sideways, front ways. Okay, that's the whole, very interesting. The whole whole that's gambit that you could think of if, okay. if you could control the direction of it. But I was well aware of time, but it was not like it is that it continuously goes forward, you know, incrementally and you know time flies when you're having fun kind of stuff that didn't exist i could be at any point actually one of my interactions with god at the at, i may be jumping to well heck let's just go with it. uh one of the interactions i had to god uh, god said always remember this you can be anywhere that you want to be at any time any point all you have to do is realize you're there I like it. That's beautiful. And you know I, that that along with a handful of few other things that I actually got conveyed back and forth from God. That that's one of those things that actually really stuck with me. That you're actually there. Okay. Yeah. So with the angel, the angel was helping you to remember mm-hmm. things, and you were experiencing a lot of um, new sensations, new things all around you, visuals probably emotions, probably uh, energies. And um, and then what happened? What, how did you get to the point when you were able to speak with God? How did you get there? Okay. Well, uh, I can't tell you when this happened because you know, there's not a really a chronological order. It could be like, right. insert this, mm-hmm. with, this dance step here led me to this dance step there. It... it conceivably happened all at once actually uh, or it didn't it's a it, the time frame that i could muster to actually tell you it either happened in a blink of an eye or it was over a span of lifetimes now i mean life that makes sense actually yes yeah, so okay. um uh, i can remember bob t uh bob took me on many many i guess if you would have for lack of a better word trips um to various right various existences uh, meeting this that and the other entities and seeing this that and the other uh, w- bob and i uh, were on i i guess for lack of a better word on another world i was on a beachfront a beautiful okay. place beautiful place and here this is to answer your thing when i comprehended when god uh, when i was uh, met god uh, this is to answer that question specifically. Well, and before you go there, since you, you say you had met, met, you were taking, this reminds me a lot of what happened in my near-death experience, too, and I was taken on a journey through many worlds, but you said you met a lot of entities. Did you have conversations? Were things revealed to you from these other experiences with these other entities that you think are, are should be shared that would be helpful to our listeners? No, oh, well, yeah. Uh, conversations like uh, like we're having this this general discourse between you and I uh, didn't occur. It wasn't a verbal discourse. It was sort of like you know uh, interacting with something, touching. Some, it wasn't a physical touch. It was you know interacting with some some entity. It wasn't like I right. ask you a question, you you report back with an answer. No, nah, it was sort of like, okay, here you go. Here's telepathic m- communication that no, went not from exactly consciousness that, yeah. to consciousness. No, this was depending on what the the entity wanted to transfer to me. I could live the entire entity's existence that they wanted to share with me, and obviously right. there was bits and pieces of it that you know, they could keep secret or whatever, or hide from me, but it was sort of like not being a third-person reviewer. It would be like stepping in, in the shoes of uh, this entity and go, oh, here, 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 here's what I did. Boom, you got it. So you were able to experience their experiences almost as if you were them, perhaps? Uh, exactly like them. It was, okay. you know, I could remember being on a water world or in, in the water kind of consistency. 
uh, with one entity. Uh, there was, you know, there's, there's just so just picking it out of thought processes. I could sit here and tell you about many, many encounters I had with, with them. It was to uh, simplify the answer was it was a instant transfer. Okay. If you, if you will, it was like, Oh, it was like awakening to how did I forget that sensation, you know, kind of, kind of recall. It was like, oh, okay, yeah, and it, you get the whole gambit, pain, elation, the whole, whole spectrum of emotions, and memories, and, and encounters, and all this from the other entity, all at once. Right. Yeah, it was yeah and I wrote about something real similar to this in Passage to the Ancient, which um, is part of the Mysteries of the Redemption series, which goes into how we are taking in the knowledge of many lives. Um, it sounds similar, where um, memories of other beings, other people, and our own past lives were being like brought back to memory. And you were remembering how it felt, taking in those things in the context of your current life, uh, the one, the life you had just left behind. Is that similar to what you experienced? No, it was. It wasn't like I stepped out of my shoes and used my my own experience as being in this body uh, from the context and saying, "Well, this is a third person review." This is like, oh, I remember. You know, it's like you know if. If right. You yeah. walked in and said, "Here, live my life." It was like I I reviewed it as, "Oh, I'm Sean and I'm watching this big grandiose movie." No, I wouldn't like that. Okay. It was like it was like Marilyn. You know, all of a sudden, I remember being Marilyn. Right. Exactly. Or exactly. whatever you know, whatever the entity was. You know, it was it was similar in retrospect from entity to entity how the the transfer of of knowledge, if you will, that's that's, that's actually a dumbing down of it. It was uh, experiences, knowledge, right, the, yeah. whole, the whole breadth the and whole width thing. of of the existence of this particular entity was gifted. Uh, it wasn't right. a third per it wasn't a third person sensation. It wasn't like watching a movie or listening to a podcast or a mu- musical composer right. or whatever. It was just like here, 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 I am. You were experiencing it as if you were them. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. But all and at so once. Then, it was, it was, right, it was all at different. once, all mm-hmm. at the same time, in the same instant. And then at some point, um, Bob, the angel, takes you, or somehow you get to be in the presence of God, mm-hmm. as you perceived it. So how did that happen? Okay, uh, back to where I was on a beach. Now, this is one of the few times that I can remember actually having any kind of body. Um, okay. Bob was you know, uh, trying to make me remember certain things and said, oh, here's a, here's another thing. You know, I can remember Bob taking, to, taking me to a grave that looked like mine and mm-hmm. kind of stuff. But, you know, it was various things that led me up to this particular thing or I can, you know, it's kind of hard to, to say the, you know, like I said, it's hard to say what come first chicken or egg on this one. But this particular event was, uh, Bob asked me to reach down and pick up this rock off of the Sandy beach. You know, I can remember everything about the Sandy beach, about how the wind blew. It was blowing, a. a Across from, not from the ocean, but actually down from the direction I was uh, pointed in, was uh, alongside the ocean as it was, you know, washing up onto the beach. And I remember the glistening of the uh, actual sand grains and all this. And I picked up this rock at the uh, at the request of Bob, and Bob said, "Okay, feel where this rock has been," and. It was, I could feel where it had, had been. I could watch it, you know, you know, assimilate itself into this particular rock and vice versa, where it came from and, and all the energies and, and uh, you know, just the micro existence of this thing, how it began, how it ended, where it was going from that point forward. 
And uh, then uh, Bob asked me, well, turn it over. I'm like, wait a minute. Why'd you ask me that? And then I turned it over, and then for whatever reason, everything clicked. This was at the point where I realized everything was connected. Okay. Uh, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't like you could just reach in and you know, like a zipper, and unzip a, a, a coat and say, "Okay, the the coat's open," or you know, zip it back up, and it was you know. It was irrevocably. Uh, you couldn't disconnect, uh, chop up, chop up the existence of this particular rock. Everything was connected from from tip to tail, as my grandmother would say. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, I realized what God was, who God was, and uh, this is actually one of the first few times that uh, the emotional. Um, sensation hasn't overwhelmed me to the point where I'm going to start crying on you. But uh, uh, I realized that Bob was actually God. Okay, so the angel was then revealed himself as God. But, you know, you said that you had had a realization of what God was and who God was. And I know that it's hard to put these things in words, but what was God and who was God, God in that moment? God is for you. Everything. I, it's not. It's okay. like being a part of God. You realize that you're a part of God's existence. Yeah, uh, for lack of a better word, God is. That's you know. You asked me right, you know, last night about uh, uh, what I got from that I could share with everybody. God is. God is the air that we breathe. God is, you know, the table that my MacBook's on top of, the wheelchair that I'm sitting in. You know, all of these are a part of God's existence. You know, okay. To, for for lack of a better word or phrase or sentence to comprehend to encompass what it is, it's everything. God's everything. And then you said you knew who God was. Mm-hmm. God. And what what was that in your words? God is, um, what can I, how can I phrase this? God ha, God is, uh, that, God is all knowledge, all thinking, all, everything that w- could be, possibly could be, what isn't, even the darkest recesses of anyone, anyone's mind, any darkest recesses or brightest recesses of anybody's mind god is you know but it's not like it it's a part of everything it's it's such a um non-corporeal and corporeal thought process to realize that i'm not god and uh, right and the uh Entity, the realization of everything around me is God. Uh, the the mentality, the whole encompassing of what God is. I just don't have the words to express other than God is everything, and God talks. Yeah, I understand. You know, it, yeah, it's 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 like it's like, hey, Bob. You know, I recognize your face. <laughs> you know. So when you had this this sudden knowledge, and, and the angel becomes God before you, and you all of a sudden have all this knowledge about what and who God is coming over you. I'm curious about um, how did that impact you coming from the previous state of mind that you had before you had died? Um, and Because you said it's, it, it makes you feel tearful and emotional, which makes perfect sense. Um, did it just kind of like wash all that away, or was it a gradual thing where you were, you know, how did that affect you considering what your your perception was before your death? My perception before before death, I had I was questioning God's existence at that time. Right. God, yeah. So how did this how did this affect you then? Yeah, it was it Either. was like a. a this barrier that, in my knowledge, my memory, that God 
actually existed. That barrier between whatever it was, the barrier was broken that I, you know, recall that God existed. It was like, wow, how in the world did I forget that? It was that kind of sensation. And in wow, com- so this was, this was actually like the ultimate part of what you needed to remember. To a certain extent, yeah, I guess, I guess you could say that. It was, at one point during this, this whole gambit of uh, my near-death experience, I could recall... Uh, so much about, I don't know if it was me interacting with all these entities or me just recalling everything that had occurred in lifetimes all at once, but I could see offshoots of variations of me in different um, aspects. It's kind of, it's kind of weird. It's sort of, uh, for lack of a better word, echoes of myself. Kind of stuff. Echoes of yourself. Did you feel at the time that these were past lives, or did you just feel that these were like echoes of yourself? No, it was just memory. It was like all of, everything existed at once. Okay. Uh, is it, it wasn't like a exactly. okay. To to you know, I hate to use the word the phrase dumb down, but to dumb down it, it was it was just like realizing that everything existed inside of me at once. And I could express it, you know, share it, uh, consume it all at once, and there was no barriers. It was, it was sort of like my ability to think has had expanded onto. I can't even quantitate that how how I thought okay. at that point. I, I wish I could at certain certain aspects, but every question that I ever asked, I wanted to ask, or even questions that I, in retrospect, think back and say, well, should I ask that and got that answer? And it, it was it was just the, the mind-blowing realization that, you know, the existence, uh, you exist past this body that we're in. Uh, okay. Well, you know that would be that would probably be your awe-inspiring kind of grasping, going, "Wow, there was something that passed this, you know, your last beating heart beat or your last breath." That in itself was like, "Oh, okay, yeah, all right." Yeah, but you know, the, the knowledge that God existed was bigger than that. It was I don't. Uh, <laughs> How could how could I explain this? It's, it's so hard to convey what that sensation was. To actually know that something uh, lay, uh, lies beyond not only, not only the grave but also beyond the the conceptualization of breaking down that barrier of realizing that actually God does exist. God is uh, very much a part of everybody's life, whether you like it or not. Uh, you know, a lot of people that whether I've, you're aware of it or not, yeah, yeah. whether you're aware yeah. of it or not. And I've had people say, you know, I've actually spoke to people and told them bits and pieces about this this uh, sensation, or not sensation, this experience. Um, and they say, I don't believe you. I said, Well, okay. After this lifetime's over, if if there's an existence at the end of it, we can compare notes. How's that? You can talk, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's funny because uh, uh, a 16th century mystic, Emanuel Swedenborg, um, he had many, many visions of the afterlife. And when people would say that to him, he would say the same thing. He said, that's okay. We'll talk about it in the afterlife. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, yeah, that reminded me of him. So here you are, and you've had this um, realization that is pretty beyond words that, you know, God is in everything, mm-hmm. um, he is everything, and, and you're experiencing it, and you know it as an absolute fact of existence, and it's, um, you know, it's mind-bending. And then what happens with God after this? Because I know that you had mentioned having some conversations, and that God told you some things. Um, what happened, and what what did he say? <laughs> wow, Okay. Uh, that's a rather broad spectrum uh, question. Um, uh, everything that I ever want to know or not want to know or any fleeting thoughts that, Hey, what was behind door this door that I've never opened before, but I knew that door existed. What was behind that door? That door was no longer there. I knew exactly. It was like, you know, uh, 
getting over the fear of there's a door there and realizing there's an actually not a door there kind of uh-huh. sensation. I knew exactly everything at ever at any point, you know, you know, just realize that you're already there, there. Right. Kind mm-hmm. of, kind of mentality or spirituality or however you want to put it. But, you know, if, uh, I have not referenced, um, uh, my own, um, spiritual belief systems during this whole thing, but it actually does encompass my own spiritual belief systems, uh, which mm-hmm. I am a Christian, you know, I'll just let, let that out. And, right. Uh, yeah, I do pray various times throughout the day. I don't pray enough, even though, you know, you may think that I may, if I do give you how often I do pray, you probably say, well, you do pray a lot. But honestly, it's, it's one of those things, uh, what God had revealed to me and what God God asked of me uh, to, you know, it, it was sort of like, uh, here's the key to all knowledge. You know, you right. have... You gave me the free will to you know, use that key, if, for lack of a better term, to open up any Pandora's box, if you want to use that particular term that I wanted, or whatever. It was known to me automatically. When you say open up the Pandora's box, he was he was giving you permission to open up not only the good, but the, the things that might not be so good, or did you, every, is that when, how you meant it? When, when I say everything, that means everything. Okay. Every, everything that you know is in the existence of God. So, okay. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, I've relayed to just a, a few people, and I'll watch. I'll, I'll tell you on this one is I actually ask God, and this is one of the the key questions that I reflect on, and the answer I can't really give you, other than I, the answer itself. I question why in the world did I ask that, and why in the world did God give me the answer? Is God? How do you see? How do you experience everything? Okay. And to allow you to know that, you know, was like I'm not God. I can't let you know because I'm not God to gift that to you. Uh, and I can't even grasp it. I it's it's all inspiring. Usually, when I do uh, my dreams themselves. Uh, are mostly of near-death experience kind of uh, thought processes, I guess, if you if you will. That's you know that's when I experience you know when I ha- I've had conversations with God in my dreams after the fact. But uh, to answer the question that I started on and I actually got off, did an offshoot, but God gifted me the ability to see things as God perceives. And, right, and yeah. it was I, it was like taking uh, uh, my individual mentality at that time with the expanded you know, consciousness of being a- anywhere and everywhere at the same time, and then exactly. you know <laughs> smash that with a hammer and dust that off the top of the uh, of the uh, workbench and, and saying, okay, here's your here's your new set of glasses. See how you like it. <laughs> So yeah. I can't, I can't even grasp it. You know, I've you know, there's many many questions that I think about from the near death experience that I actually think back and say, well, why do I have this knowledge? And you know, the curious thing is, is you know, I tell everybody that if you have a question about spirituality, just go straight to God and just ask. You know, you may like the answer, you may not like the answer, but you know, listen for it. You may you may be surprised. Yeah, mm-hmm. which we focus a lot on in, um, you know, in the, the way we try to help people with the, in the Out of Body Travel Foundation to, you know, focus on both prayer and meditation. Meditation is listening and prayer is speaking to God and asking those questions. And so at some point in the experience, you had mentioned a conversation with God of some type, and I understand that it's beyond words and all those things, mm-hmm. um, but what was the general idea of the conversation that you took back with you? Uh, just more or less uh, realizing who God was. Um, 
being able to communicate back and forth with God, I think that was the the biggest thing was uh, to skip to the end of my near death experience. Uh, okay. God, God was wanting me to stay and go on from this existence. And one okay. of the, you know, I, I remember having the conversations and the discourse and the arguments. I actually argued with God at, at rather length, beyond length. You know, I like to argue. Don't get me wrong. I like to argue, but this was way beyond what I normally would argue with anybody. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, just being able to re- recall and remember that, you know, a lot of people look at it as, you know, the, doing the formal prayer of, you know, however you do your, your prayers, you know, whatever formality that you go through, that God is so close to you that it, it, God's closer to you than the skin on the back of your hand. And being able to relay information back to God is just simply to think about it or talk about it or just include God in your everyday con- conceptualization of how you think. You know, right. you know, it's like, you know, don't worry about it. God already knows because, you know, if you're sitting there listening to this particular podcast on an MP3 player or iPhone or MacBook or PC or whatever, God is between you and, and that PC or whatever implementation that you're listening to. To, you know, just to remember that you can talk to God. There's nothing between you and God other than your your free will to ignore. Right. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? It makes very much sense. Absolutely. And, yeah, very and much And that's, so. that's the barrier that we are gifted. Well, it's not a barrier. It's actually the free will is the biggest gift that God has even get, given anybody. And uh, from the perspective that I have of what I've interacted with, uh, uh, Satan, demons, and the negative stuff, they want to take that that free will gift away from you. And, that's true. Yes, very true. Yeah, you know, and and be glad about it. That's that's the, that's the puzzling thing to be glad about giving your free will over to something else. And I I, I have this conversation. You know, two or three times a week about this very particular subject, free will. Why does everybody want, want to give away their free will? Um, other than, <laughs> I don't know. That's I, I could probably answer that before the near-death experience, but now uh, uh, one, of the, one of my friends that I just befriended a couple of weeks ago, she asked me, said, after your near-death experience, do you come back the same man as you were before the NDI? I said, absolutely not. I said, I'm not, and I'm not that, that Sean that entered the thing. And the curious thing, which I don't know if uh, this makes sense to you, but it makes perfect, uh, sort of makes perfect sense to me, and then it doesn't, that I sure. have a, uh, a lot of problems with, Time itself, time is always flowing and fast forward with me. And I have a lot of deja vu or uh, what's that? Uh, uh, for whatever reason, the, the term escapes me. Uh, the It's like I'm in an alter, alternate reality. I'm remembering things that um, happened in my past life that other people should remember or they'll come to me with a, an alternate view on a particular uh, memory or an event that I took place with this particular person and my memory of the event is altered or is no longer there like what okay uh, what uh, I can't remember whatever it was the Mandela effect that's what I'm looking for for whatever reason that escaped me um, uh, shortly after I got back and started living, uh, here in this house with my f- uh, aunt and my grandmother, I was looking outside this, this old house is like 120 years old, give or take. And I was looking out mm-hmm. back uh, in the back of the, the house in this r- rather large yard. And I remember, uh, some gooseberry bushes being, being out there. And uh, I remember, you know, eating these gooseberry bushes out of season and, and thinking, oh, my God, how sour is that thing? It's bitter, sour kind of stuff. And I remember playing croquet around these gooseberry bushes. And I asked my uh, family member, I said, well, where's those gooseberry bushes at? 
And this family member replies, what gooseberry bushes you're talking about? I said, the gooseberry bushes that were in the backyard here. There was never a gooseberry bushes back there. And I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, similar things like that. My memory of something is altered here. Like yeah, uh, one of the... One of the perspectives that I had uh, uh, on the day that I was released after a three-month stint in the hospital after my amputation, my father uh, my father passed away on the same day. They actually released me a little earlier than they had planned on just because of this event. And uh, my father, uh, the day that we actually got to uh, inter him into the ground, he... Uh, the it was in a big cemetery that I was well aware of. I had been there many times before because my my grandmother, and my uncle had been buried there, and I knew my dad was going to be buried next to my my uh, uncle. And mm-hmm. um, the grave site that I remember in this particular grave uh, graveyard, you know, was well known to me, but the grave site that I remember where my uncle was versus where it was then was in totally different uh, area. Okay. And uh, just because of my, you know, I haven't been able to, you know, get up to where, you know, uh, where my, my father, my grandfather, my, now my grandmother and my uncle uh, are buried there on the side of a hill, which, you know, the graves of my grandfather and grandmother are where I remember them, but where my uncle and my dad was, or my uncle was, uh, hold on just a second. Let me, let me, let me put you on mute. Okay. Okay. Hello. Wow, that's a far before whatever. Okay, sorry about that. That was actually, I got a delivery. Sorry about that. <laughs> well, okay. I'll go in and edit this out. Uh, where was I? Um, the graveyard. The graveyard. Um, now nah, I've totally lost my train of thought. Gee whiz. Got so in-depth with it. I guess what I was uh, explaining was the difference between my memory before versus the memory now where my great, where my uncle was buried. Um, uh, A totally different spot. It was actually the the graveyard itself was set up in a horseshoe pattern where you actually enter this particular portion of this huge cemetery. Okay. Okay. Where my, my dad was, or my uncle was buried, was actually at the entrance to the horseshoe portion of the, of the, the road that goes into, into the depth of this particular uh, graveyard versus where they are now. They're actually at the, the bowing, uh, you know, the elbow or the, you know, the curvature of the horseshoe of the road is where my uncle is buried now. Versus okay. what I remember where he was buried before. Okay, so you had some changes in your memories when you returned. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd like to return back to when you're um, face-to-face with God. You had mentioned to me uh, before that, that you asked God um, some questions, uh, like about the fact that, um, you know, why was he... Uh, appearing to you when you were, um, when you had, you know, had all these doubts about him in your previous, in your existence before your death. Can you talk about that? Um, okay. Right before, uh, when I realized who God was and the, the breadth and width of that particular statement, um, right. I actually asked God, why are, why are you allowing me in front of you? After all these myriad of reasons, you know, I cursed you. I tried to more or less just carve you out of my life, it ignored you, all this other stuff. And this this particular uh, section of my memory, I didn't remember until uh, about six months ago, 
four months ago, give or take. But um, uh, just the awe-inspiring answer, uh, more uh, to sum it up, is like you, you were just too young. You were learning about the environment. You were learning about your existence. And, you know, he, what really got me was how close God actually was. He showed me and just transferred the experiences of, of God being around me. The, you know, he was always constantly there, even though I was more or less taking a baseball bat proverbially and trying to bat him out of my life, beat it out of my, beat God out of my life. You know, curse him the whole gambit that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah the, so uh, just the but answer. But he understood. So he understood. He understood the, the, what, the, what you the were answer. going through. Yeah. yeah. It, you know, it was it was just like uh, he said, as not unlike any anybody else. You know, everybody has different experiences. That's why I allow them to be, uh, you know, live their lives. You know. Yours in particular was was like a, a snowflake among many snowflakes, but you know you still come to this point where you try to rip me all, out of your life. But you know it was sort of like being a uh, a parent, sort of speak, but uh, okay, kind of deal. Uh, I think that may may not be the word I want to choose, but you know, I'll go with it. Um, just just saying hey you sean the you were just you just did not want to be around me and you wanted to experience life without me so i allowed it okay it was it was the end all beat all consumption if you will the answer to free will that was free will right there he said i allowed you to do your free will okay and then realizing that uh, I was absolutely wrong, <laughs> God, you know, coming <laughs> coming back coming back and you know realize you know the one main thing that when I woke up in the bed after the the, the near death experience, surrounded by a bunch of nurses I never knew in another town that I knew the town, and I'm like, oh, where am I? How long have I been out? Kind of answers, and then having this 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 feeling this knowledge this this uh, inherent knowledge that god's all around me going oh my god and then you know it, it was like waking up and still t bringing back with me the sensation some of the sensations i don't have the expanded uh, uh, knowledge or the abilities to you know see at different points of view or whatever you know my expanded sensations awareness of my environment that I did but I did come back with certain lights on if that makes sense <laughs> right yeah that makes sense and so you mentioned earlier that um, God had given you that other message did that happen directly after this and were there any other conversations that you had or questions that you asked God and what were his replies before you returned uh, well uh... Uh, that's that's a that's a catch-all kind of put it in the bucket kind of thing. But anything and everything I really wanted to know, it was automatically available to me. I know I'm really kind of shortening that down to one simple answer because you ask one one giant question to encompass every question they ever asked of God. But uh, you know, I could I could spend days telling you about each individual question. You know. Like uh, you know, I remember asking where my body was, and this is okay. this is this is kind of kind of weird to say the say the least, because of the, uh, this Mandela effect kind of you know makes sense to me. What is this Mandela effect? That what are you, what are you referring to when you say the Mandela effect? My my remembrance of what happened occurred in my life before versus what is physically in front of me. And the uh, memories of people that, are, that I've lived my entire life with is okay. is different. Not different in, in totality, but different in certain aspects. You know, okay. I recently had a conversation with uh, uh, my brother about a particular trip that we had uh, in in our youth uh, to Virginia Beach, actually. 
and he he explained uh, to me actually that I, he just told me the story uh, over um, holiday dinner a few weeks ago, and um, and I'm thinking I don't remember this <laughs> or, or what, uh, but uh, he 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 gave me this whole scenario and he said yeah you remember that you remember this old van that Dad had the, it was a Volkswagen green lime green van from the eighties. And, uh, Travis or my brother was telling me the, the whole story. And I'm thinking back, well, I don't remember this. I remember the trip, but I don't remember this. Where did this come from? Uh, little bits and pieces of that, you know, either physically different than I remember or the, uh, the memory of somebody else is, is, uh, uh, telling me that, Hey, something's different. Okay. If that answers the Mandela effect here. Sure, uh, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. And so when you returned, um, so at some point before you returned, God shared with you the message that you shared earlier, which was that you can be at any moment in time or at any point of existence um, just by choosing to be there. Is that, did I summarize that correctly? You, uh, it's not a choice to be there, it's just realizing that you're already there. Okay, so realizing that you're already there. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then so you returned to your body. You had some lights on that were different than what you had before, and you had this experience, and now you, you're totally aware of God's presence. Mm-hmm. Um, how did it change your life? I have a lot more patience than I did. I was an impatient son of a gun before. You know, it was... To borrow a Bible uh, comparison, I have I have the patience of Job now. I I can't wow. say that it was it was it it just is. Just, I have the patience. I can allow things to progress, even if I know that I have no problem with stuff progressing at its own pace. Sometimes you know that that, that I guess that's the biggest thing. I have my patience has changed. The lights that were turned on, I can sense different things. I have seen different things. I have have had prophetic dreams. I've had dreams that, you know, I woke up um, uh, several years ago. Turkey was going through a revolution, and a lot of stuff happened during uh, this revolution. If you remember, it was probably about two and a half years ago. And I remember waking up from a dream, and I was in the middle of this crowd in this dream. And all this, all these things was, you know, there's a lot more to this dream than I'm, I'm, I'm sharing right now. But just to, uh, to say that, uh, to give you an example of, of what's different. I didn't have these types of dreams before, but I woke up to this, you know, from this dream going, I was just in the middle of this crowd and never going nuts. I mean, this vast crowd going nuts outside of, in the middle of this city, which I, you know, I, I, later found well not later found out i woke up to uh, my news feeds clicking off saying there was a big revolution in turkey and i'm like wow i was just there <laughs> right. it was literally mm-hmm. breaking news and i was like i was just there but there was there are some other aspects that i left out of this that actually make uh, makes the the um the encounter and the dream uh more in depth but you know that's just an example Right. And so, you know, when you came back, and now you're back, and you're experiencing your life, and, you know, I guess one thing that I would ask is, what would you say to your former self, or, you know, um, in another way of putting it, you know, to other people who are struggling with the exact same things that you struggled with before you died, Um, and with the, you know, and and you've mentioned a few things over this interview with, you know, sharing things with other people. But mm-hmm. what would be the, the thing that you would say to your former self or to people who are struggling in that same way? If I could go back, I don't know if I would go back. It would change my entire existence if I could go back and say, hey, Sean, don't be, don't be a, a, a nut. Don't do that. You know, I've, that, that's a good question. Uh, if I could do that, I would just say, "Hey, numbskull, you know, God exists. Don't don't toy with that idea. 
uh, that's a, a, a no brainer. Uh, God does okay. exist. You know, if 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 I could gift any particular uh, perspective, knowledge, full knowledge of is that God exists. If I could have gifted that to myself during any point of, of time, that would have changed my entire life, entire life. Period, without a doubt. Okay. And so how does that impact you now in the sense of how do you live your life differently? Now that uh, obviously, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that you were so much more patient, which, you know, I would gather, you know, God gave you that grace in part because you had to deal with, you know, losing your leg and learning how to, you know, um, get around in a wheelchair and all the other things that come with that kind of a major physical um, disability. Um, what other things in terms of the way you approach life now has changed? Uh, I'm more mindful of people around me. I'm more mindful that, you know, my, uh, my decisions and the way I look at life is, could be close to, say, yours, Marilyn, or it may not, or it may be you know, just that exact polar opposite you know, how I view certain things to be done or not to be done or, you know, whatever views. You know, I'm mind, more mindful of that than I ever was. Uh, it's, I guess... So you're my, more aware of, like, how your actions affect other people around you, so you're more thoughtful about what you choose to do or not do? Is that what you're saying? I'm, I, uh, what, I, what I agreed to do uh, to come back... Uh, Okay, so you had an agreement before you came back. Well, the the agreement was to allow me to come back. It wasn't that God was okay. saying, "Hey, Sean, you need to go back," and I'm sort of fighting to stay. No, it was the other way around. I was fighting to come back. The, okay. Uh, um, the agreement was to come back and help a certain few of people. I, you know, everybody, when I do approach this to certain people, uh, and a lot of people haven't heard this particular part of the story, but I fought or fought, argued, argued and fought probably, probably you could probably interchange that with eight particular people. And, uh, in my life, you know, I, Three of them I know, five of them I don't. You know, as okay. of right as of right now. But I argued at that time that I intimately knew each one of those those folks at that time, and and the other five I have no clue who they are. Can I feel feel them? Sure. Um, do I know they exist? Yeah, I know they exist. But at the time when I was arguing, God would, uh, God said, Sean, you don't have to worry about them. Let them live their lives out. They'll be here just in a moment. Just at that time, I was impatient. You know. Okay. And I was like, no, I need to do this right now. That was one of the things. I guess that may have been one of the gifts that God gave me to to realize that. You know, a lifespan on any particular person is not that great. It, uh, you know, it's more of you know, a blink, less than a blink of an yeah, eye. Yeah, like a blink of an eye, which is interesting in that it goes back to yeah. the eyes that you saw. <laughs> well, the reference back to before I went to heaven to whatever that that interaction with that entity or entities, if you want to... Uh, Cumulate or at all those whatever eyes were. I even think I can remember trying to count them, but I couldn't keep up with the count. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, the the gifts that uh, you know, the arguments and stuff that I had with God right before I left. You know, uh, me arguing, saying, "Hey, I need to go back." The instant that I said, you know, made up my mind that, you know, I was teetering back and forth. Should I go with God and go wherever God wanted me to go? Or do I need to say, oh, no, I'm going to stamp my foot. I'm going to do this. Well, I came to that conclusion that I got to go back. You know, I okay. steadfast in my you know thought process. I said, no, I've got to go back and help these folks for whatever reason. And this was the first point that I actually heard somebody say something. And it was like okay. God come up to me at that point 
It's like I was on a preface, uh, uh, you know, on the edge of a ledge, so to speak, I guess, you know, proverbially. Um, mm-hmm. I heard God said nothing else. After I steadfastly said, no, I got to go back, I heard God say, this is going to hurt. And that's the the words that I recall on a daily basis, multiple times during the daily basis. You know the the meanings of that that statement that God made to me at that point uh, ex, expand the meaning. The meaning expands every day. Now, it, right? Is it physical? Yeah, it was physical. And, you know, waking waking up to going to sleep with a leg and waking up and like, oh, where did uh, Two thirds of my leg go, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, all of that, you know, that was physical pain. You know, there's a, there's a lot more to this is going to hurt than just that physical pain. You know, that's that's nothing. Pain's nothing to me. Uh, the other thing I woke up to is I have no fear of dying, Why, any shape, form, or fashion. It could be the most horrible type of death that you you can uh, conceivably comprehend. To you know dying in your sleep or whatever it happens you know i'm okay with it i don't have any fear of death whatsoever mm-hmm. and, uh, and a lot of people who have near-death experiences report that yeah so they lose their fear of death and i don't feel good. i don't fear anything spiritual either uh, that's that's the one that's the one caveat there i don't you know people uh talk about you know fearing uh, ghosts or demons or anything like that. You know, I'm not saying that I, I don't respect those uh, particular entities or whatever, but I don't fear them either. And I know where they come from. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. It may, may not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does make sense. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. And so, you know, it sounds like the, the uh, all-encompassing experience was really can be summed up in in the fact that God is. And um, for those who are listening who are, you know, they're looking for answers and they don't know what to believe, you know, they don't know if God exists or uh, does he exist, does he not exist, and they're confused about it. Your experience, I think, is real helpful for them, you know, to have something to reflect upon from someone who is coming from a very similar place. Um, and what you experienced when you died, um, which was very beautiful. So I thank you for sharing it with us. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we close our interview? Uh, the biggest thing that I could probably possibly convey to anybody um, is, you know, I know right now the trend is belittling people that pray. Uh, you know, trying to make that prayer is not worth it. You know, it's more or less, you know, uh, <laughs> to kind of quantitate it is a fart in the wind. It's not that. It, it, prayer <laughs> is the most, prayer is the most. I love your Southern euphemisms. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe, that's maybe that's why one. people I love like. it and I'm going to use it. Yeah, I'm going to uh, use it my whole right, life now. Go right ahead. Um, my, <laughs> my girlfriend's from Canada and she, she loves when I come up with these kind of crazy stuff, but it's, it's just the way it is. But, uh, yeah, today and nowadays they, they are trying to, to make a light of prayer, how useless prayer is. And prayer is one of the things that is the most powerful thing that, that you can possibly have. I've seen prayer, even before this NDE that I had, this near-death experience, I've seen prayer affect people, affect outcomes. Yeah. Uh, you know, where I worked in the hospital, and my hospital career was actually really robust, and I was actually, you know, had a really good career. Um, and versus what I'm doing right now, I would have never thought I'd be talking on the phone about a near-death experience. You know, that was not my life path. My life path was to help people sleep medically <laughs> or help mm-hmm. them breathe medically. But uh, right. the, the end all beat all is folks that, that prayer is by far the most powerful thing that we could possibly do. And to do it with someone else, to pray in conjunction with someone else, that magnifies that, that prayer. 
that that openness in your near death experience was that one of the things that you were given to understand or see or know was about the power of prayer is that something that was kind of just shown to you or revealed to you somehow uh yes yeah 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 uh to try try to make sense of what you just asked prayer itself uh in conjunction with other people praying about the same thing is so so powerful it sets emotion so much uh that you're not not even that i can comprehend or you can comprehend or the listeners that can comprehend the 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 earnest the the power behind a particular prayer in with in conjunction with somebody else praying or multiple people praying can uh, move mountains can move can um can change the outcome of one particular person's life that can affect everybody else's life. It's it's one of those things that the openness of prayer to learn that there's nothing between you and God. There should not be a reason to pray to God to you know just openly talk to God. You know, uh, my openness to God now is instead of you know people you know down on bending knee talk to God. Well, I'm sitting in a wheelchair. And I'm telling God, hey, I forgot to put this spice in this chicken I just fried. What, well, you know, you know, it, that level of me talking to God is what I do now. Is I try yeah. to include God in everything, every thought process, and the openness, you know, your ability to talk to God. It may sound like I'm crazy, and you know, if it is, if that's the way you view it, that's fine. Not a problem to me. You know, we'll clear that up afterwards. We'll compare notes, like I said before. But um, you know, just just to be open and talk to God, you'll be surprised how God will respond. You may not like it sometimes. You know, I got smoked pretty bad to uh, to use a Canadian uh, frame. Is uh, I got smoked by God uh, to realize that hey, I I do exist. It took my, the loss of my leg. To realize that you know I was <laughs> I was woefully unaware and I chose to be unaware of God. So yeah, yeah. But it's it's fabulous. Well, it's, it's fantastic. I would I would not change my my outcome right now from losing my leg because at well, this, and that's a powerful statement. Yeah. Yeah. You you, you asked me. You asked me before what would I do to change everything. I wouldn't be the same man I am right now if I did if I went back and changed it. Uh, uh, I think I think I grew a lot in the whole the whole gambit of my entire life. Okay, so Sean, you mentioned to me that you also experienced something else during your near death encounter wherein you experienced other people's heavens and hells. And I wanted to ask you about that. What did you see? What did you feel? What happened there? Well, with uh, to go back to one of the uh, prime questions you asked me, well, what did God share with me? And this is one, mm-hmm. one, one of many things that you shared with me, uh, if, you can, right. you know, if you can assign he or she to God. I don't think he can, but then you know, just my language structure refer to him as God as a he. You know, that's just it. Yeah. But anyway, to answer your question, uh, I remember being with God and God sharing with me heaven and hell and all this, all these various you know levels of heaven, levels of hell, uh, all the existences that spur out of that one perspective that one existence um okay. which one do you want to start you want to go down the hell aspect or the heaven aspect or how you want to do this uh, let's start with the let's start with the lower and, and move up how about that <laughs> okay at the you uh, had said to me uh, that it was a pretty traumatic experience going into these um hell realms um so i'm very intrigued with you know what you experienced there well at this point um uh, uh, God was with me along with Bob or whatever you want to call, uh, however you want to f- focus on. It the angel, matter. yeah. It do- does not matter to me at this point. But uh, uh, the experience that I had, uh, we were in this discourse, I guess you could probably uh, you know, sum up 
And I had this curious thought of what hell would be like. And then okay. all of a sudden I was there. Uh, okay. Now, at this point, everything around me, the, it was sort of like everything got dull. Like got, you know, you, it was not uh, a sensation that, you know, that hurt me or gave me pain physically or anything like that. It was coming from one existence to another existence. It was like everything was darker uh, instead of being surrounded by... Uh, all the creation, you know, it was sort of like being hidden from creation. Wow, interesting. Uh, okay. But, you know, it was, if you could think, I hate to, hate to borrow, well, I guess, uh, you know, God likes to copy and paste a lot of stuff so, throughout the creation. <laughs> so um, this actually kind of makes sense to me now, now that I'm actually trying to surmise this. Uh, being, like I explained in the first in the first podcast, uh, being in this area where I was surrounded by these eyes in this in this globe, if you can think of it being vastly greater in um, expanse, I was in the middle of this snow glo- snow globe kind of thing. If you can think of it like that, but it was a dark snow globe, and every you know there was layers upon layers of you know these look like human beings. But the, they had sort of the generalized form of human beings, and then some of them weren't human beings. But the ones that I interacted with were human humans. Uh, they sort of look like uh, uh, balloons. Uh, I can not balloons. If you remember the story about pillars of salt, um, yeah, that's that story in the old Is, testament. And regarding Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah, mm-hmm. kind of kind of deal. They sort of look like that, and they didn't really have a lot of distinctive features to say, "Oh, this is you know, you know who X Y or Miss Smith or Mister Smith or whatever." They all had similar forms and features, but nothing distinctive. And it was okay. just mind-bogglingly as far as you could sense. Uh, all globally around you, you know, it was, it was kind of being cut off and not being able to feel nothing but what was inside of this globe, which is interesting. But, um, but you you could feel all this anguish, this this uh, indecision, the you know, and there was pain and you know, all the negative perspectives of anything that you could possibly do was right there you know there was no elation there was no enjoyment and you know, all, all the positive emotions and stuff was not there other than i could still feel god and uh, you know angel bob was next to me or however you want to refer refer to this the entity uh, but it was oodles of layers upon layers and you could you know i could feel where the you know the the, the globe was curving around into a globe. I could feel all the bodies around and sense these bodies. And it was, it was countless, endless darkness, uh, strife, you know, any other you know, negative word you can throw in there to describe you know, a negative experience. Uh, but it was void of anything positive. It was just... Uh, to explain to one particular uh, encounter I had, uh, I said, or, uh, asked the question, are these actually people? And I got the response, yes, these are people. Go interact with one. And uh, I connected with one, and it wasn't like you know connecting with any other entity outside of this hellish realm, or if you want to call it a realm. Um, their entirety of their uh, the the existence they were going through was like on a repeat. This particular one of the, um, I'm going to tell a story about was this lady was okay. reliving a decision that cost her the the the, uh, the life of her child. I'm not going to go into gruesome details and, and whatnot of it, but it was like. Uh, as soon as she hit the uh, the the magnification of realization, oh my God, my kid's dead, and it's my fault. 
and the all all the anguish and stuff was magnified at that point. She carried that magnification of I realized that, and then it starts all over again. Like realizing, wow. but it, it the only thing was is this person couldn't feel God in this. In her the, her hell was realizing I cost my child this this existence, this pain, this grief, this this ending of of existence on the in living. And this was, this was just continual. It was over a course, you know, I think, you know, just saying it from beginning to ending, or it was a, a little bit of time that I can actually discern that started all over from her decision of saying, oh, I'm going to do this, and oh, my God, this is going to take my life. I'm going to go with it anyway because of whatever various reasons, and then boom, you know, the kid's dead, and I realize, oh, my God, this is I'll never have her in my life again. The, all that, uh, just when it repeated, she remembered the ending of doing that, and she had to relive it all over again. And it was just a culmination. It was like a snowballing effect of uh, reliving that, and it never ended. And there was no uh, magic pill to say, stop it. Uh, don't do this. You know, she even screamed out to God to please stop this. Uh, at the end of it, and it was, just, you know, it was sort of like she could hear her, her uh, cries out to God just echo back, back to her, uh, like you know, God wasn't listening. You know, she chose this. She realizes that she did this all herself, and if. You know, there's a lot of details I'm leaving out because it it does affect me to remember that. But it it's good to share it, I think, to a certain extent, but not to the extent where there's a lot of graphic detail and stuff to you know gift gift that to you. I don't want to gift that to you. Nobody should go through. Right? That. Did you uh, did you did you uh, get informed or taught about anything? that could have changed the, cir- the the circumstances for any of these souls, or was that not made clear in any way? It was just that this is where they were. The, this is this, what they were doing. Um, what, what happened with this particular thing was, um, this was sort of a remembering of an answer to a question of, of why do we have uh, free will? And one, it's a beautiful gift, and a lot of people will probably argue, no, if I, if, you know, there's, you, you get encountered with a lot of people that don't believe in God or don't, you know, whatever their negative connotations about God, of what effects, and they bl- start blaming God like I did. Um, for right. an outcome. Okay. You get back to, well, if there is a God, why didn't God stop this or, you know, and make this event null and void or this and that and the other? And it all stems from the gift of free will. Free will that your decisions can can affect other people is, is it's a beautiful gift, but it also has a lot of uh, uh, negative and uh, vastly positive effects, and the you know the decisions that the uh, these individuals made to come to the point where they're in hell for doing certain things, they created their own hell. From my perspective, they're reliving whatever whatever decisions to the point where the they ended. At, uh, now I'll, I'll stop the end of the 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 encounter with that lady, but. Um, Whatever it was that put them in that hellish decision, that hellish outcome, they relive over and over and over and over again. How they slept with it or didn't sleep with it at the end of the end of the day before they got to hell, that's 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 individual stories. But I don't know if I did I answer that question or did I just go way off? <laughs> no, you went you went that was very helpful. You had mentioned um that when you were in the hell experience you experienced it to a certain degree but you were still very aware of the presence of god and um, but the people in hell did not have that benefit so their experience would have been even more 
severe than the one that you were having in visiting this? Uh, if you recall when I uh, told you what I felt before uh, the NDE, when I was questioning God and I, I would have this empty feeling that I can never, never, ever, you know, to my knowledge, feel. You know, it, uh-huh. I liken it to the feeling of hell, but it was so much, to, it, it was it was sort of like this ravenous beast that was just, it, any kind of glimmer of anything that was positive was automatically just eaten and, and devoured before you even had a conscious conception of that existed. It was, it, it was, riddled and and ripped from the existence of anything that had to do with goodness or kindness or happiness or anything that was positive. Okay. That's very interesting. And so so you experienced um these things in the hell realms and then um at some point you also got to experience something in the heavenly realms and what happened there and how did that come to pass? Um, this was probably, you know, uh, uh, like I said before, my conceptualization of what come first to chicken or egg or a point A, point B is totally askew. I cannot, you know, quantitate or put it in, in a chronological order what happened first or second. But uh, I think this has to do with how when I ask God how he, he experiences everything. That was my question, and the one, part of the answer was experiencing heaven with other people, not just my particular heaven. I don't, you know, uh, it was experiencing other folks' heaven that you know, you know, like the streets lined of gold that you see in uh, the scriptures and Bible verses and whatnot. You know, some people chose right. that. You know, uh, there was one fellow that chose fishing at this big lake and enjoying life you know that was his heaven um you know uh, being able to have uh, joy in just you know it, it was it, it wasn't like you were in, uh, self-imposed in your, at, from outside force you're going to enjoy your your existence whether you like it or not you know it wasn't that type of frame of reference it was just having the freedoms and full knowledge without any argument whatsoever that God existed and being able to, uh, you know, enjoy that and being a part of God's existence at that point okay. in time, if you want to even, you know, dumb it down to a uh, time frame. Uh, it was so variant. It was just like, like you... Like you experience anything and everything that was so joyous, and it was there automatically. You could, I guess you could if 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 God allowed it. You know, I I don't know. I, I'm not God, so I can't tell you. I guess you could visit other people's heavens and hells, or heavens anyway. I don't know. That's all up to God. I'm I'm not even going to venture a guess at that that answer. I mm-hmm. honestly don't know. But okay, but you experienced. A little bit of that in your near-death experience, and in, in uh, seeing some hells and seeing some heavens and seeing the contrast. And um, did you get any sense as to um, what would have been the primary difference between souls that had chosen heaven and those had, who had chosen hell? Was it the was it simply that the ones in hell were not able to live in an existence with God? Or was it, um, well, obviously there were these other issues that occurred in their lives that uh, the anguish and all the things that you mentioned, um, but it sounds so much like the people in the heavens were moving with God and the people in the hells were not. Um, Do you have any thoughts on that? Mm. As to what you saw? After what I saw, there, uh, you know, there's a, a dichotomy, a... Obviously, uh, one one eighty of each each uh, existence, hell, hell and heaven, um, mm-hmm. and, and it's all by choice. You either choose to, I don't want don't want to be a part of you. Yeah, okay, well, God will allow you up to that certain ex, you know point, 
of your existence of life to surmise and say, okay, here's your summary of your of your life, and you chose this. This is your your choice. You know, if you want to be with me, great. If you don't, here's your choice. And okay. <laughs> So, I mean, that's really well said because it is, it is that simple. And, you know, one question I have for you, and well, I don't here, here, know here, if you here, have here's, it. Here's an expansion on that. I actually uh, had okay. this, this, this kind of uh, a talk with my girlfriend about uh, time, the conception of time. She was asking me about uh, uh, how I conceive time. And, and then I got off on this, this whole aspect of uh, time is... Uh, is there, but is also meaningless to the point where it means certain aspects to us where it progressively goes. I said, how can a person live their entire life full of freaking sin, any kind of sin that you wanted to, you know, divulge other than the, the cardinal sins that you can't, can't get past. Um, how can they live their entire life and commit sin after sin, all, all the negative atrocities that a person can muster. And then at the end of it, and self-realize that their entire life was spent to come to the culmination that God existed, and I did a whole lot of bad things, and please God help me you know, to that point. You know, actually mean it, you know. You know, realize mm -hmm. that the summation. How could uh, that person on that that epitome of their entire life existence come to say, "Hey, please God, forgive me." You know, that that part of existence and time, like we said before, time. You know, the the, the lifespan of a person is less than a blink of an eye or a blink of an eye or however you want to reference it. It's actually right. next to nothing. But it is something. But to have that whole life expanse of wickedry and whatever you want to call it, however you want to connotate that, to the point where they're on their last breath and 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 ask God to forgive them and mean it. It's not just say, you know, I'm I'll get into heaven or I'll be able to enjoy God's presence if I ask for forgiveness. Ha ha ha! It's not like that, but um, right. it's actually it to, to mean it. Sincere meaning it, you know, that you that you actually learned your you lessons for it, for it to get to that and be sincere. You know, to be sincere. Yes. Um. Yeah, that I guess did that answer your question? To sort of, kinda. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, one thing I wanted to ask too about this is um, uh. From your experience, for those in our audience who may have friends or family members who are um, who have turned away from God, um, don't believe in Him anymore, or uh, have gone down a destructive path, was anything revealed to you um, that would be helpful to people who who love their you know their family members, their friends, and want to do something uh, constructive to help them, but we also know that you can only do so much or intervene so much uh, because the decision does lie with that individual. Um, from your experience, both with the near-death experience and also going back to the fact that you were like this, be the way that you were before the near-death experience, is there anything you would suggest that would be helpful and um, well, that you think could possibly you know, guide them out so of these states sure the, well there's some people that are not you know if you approach them and talk about any kind of spiritual outcome whether positive or negative or anything or say the word god or anything that has to even uh suggest uh, anything about god you know sometimes okay. talking about it uh, you know automatically for whatever reason makes them go in i'm gonna ignore you so the mm -hmm. loudest statements that a person possibly could make to folks that are so diversely against even having a discussion about it other than agreeing, hey, God doesn't exist, is live your life like you always do. You know, 
If you if you're talking about God to someone else and they overhear it, or if you're living your life from day to day, and uh, with full knowledge that God exists, people take that may be louder than any voice behind a PA system that there could be in that particular person's life. Live your life like you believe in God that you're you know you are a part of God's existence. Well, and I'm really grateful that you've shared this experience um, with us because, you know, what happens is, you know, there's so many people um, who are not going to, you know, die and experience this, um, but they have the same questions, they have the same struggles, and it's always helpful for people to hear of someone who did um, have to go through such an extreme situation with losing your leg but then, you know, going through the death experience and then coming back completely changed. And I think it's great for people to hear the stories of those who have done this because many won't have the same experience. And it gives them, uh, you know, things to think about, things to ponder on, pray on, and consider um, if they're struggling with, with the idea of whether God exists or not or how they feel about all that. And... You know, one of the things, too, that I think is real important about your testimony is the way that you experienced God as being a part of everything um, in our worlds and in our lives and in the created world like this. I think it shows people um, a different image of God than maybe what some people had um, uh, from, you know, their upbringing or what they've, you know, the, the limited things they've tried to understand, your experience shows us, you know, the great magnitude of God, which is um, an all-encompassing thing. And so I'm really grateful, Sean, that you were willing to talk about your near-death experience today with me. And, um, and so I hope everyone leaves this with some food, to, food for thought some things to think about. Mm-hmm. And um, so thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, great. Thank you for having me on, Marilyn. Uh, I hope your listeners do uh, uh, enjoy what I just uh, shared. Just a, that What I just shared was just, it wasn't even a sliver of a percent of the totality of the near-death experience. But uh, uh, God bless everyone that's listening. Uh, you know, if you want to, you know, Find me elsewhere. Go over to imdarkwaters.com and look that up, that particular th- website. And you can find me there or go listen to me on the uh, talkstreamlive.com uh, website and look up Dark Waters Radio Channel. And I'll be there. Uh, I usually got a show on every day that's usually repeat, but Saturday nights at 8 p.m. Central Time is when new shows pop up on uh, uh, yeah, my show. Yeah, your show is called. Chasing, Chasing the, the truth. truth. Yep, with Sean Graham. Chasing the truth. Chasing the so truth. So everyone, check out that show. There's a lot to learn from it. Um, from what I understand, <clears throat> there may be other interviews that you can find that will detail Sean's experience in, in even more detail. Um, can they find information about that at the Dark Waters Radio site? Or uh, like the, tell if them they where get, they can find yeah, more about your, your experience? Follow me on Twitter at... Uh, at one Seanster, the number one S H A W N S T E R. Usually, if I'm going to post anything where I'm going to be as a guest versus a host, I'll post it there. And on my Facebook is you know Sean Graham or Chasing the Truth podcast. You look there, and I'm on various other platforms. Usually, it has some sort of variant of Chasing the Truth in it. So. But if you follow me okay. there or go to IamDarkWaters.com or just send me an email, Sean G, S-H-A-W-N-G, at IamDarkWaters.com, I'll get back to you as soon as possible if you do send me something that there. That sounds great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I guess we're signing off. So <laughs> thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, um, and we will we will catch you later. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Sean. Bye. Okay, okay. we got it.